enjoy, uh, starting now for the next hour and a half, the fourth of uh, Charlie King's lectures. Okay, good morning. So, um, uh, so today I'm finally going to get to the Z2 topological insulator. So I realized I went kind of slow. I hope that was okay. You know, I opted for going slow and, and doing a lot of things in detail rather than trying to cover lots and lots of material. Um, but so today I want to talk about the uh, topological insulators. And I'm going to start um, with the um, two-dimensional uh, version of that, which is also known as a quantum spin hall, so a, a, a 2D quantum spin hall. insulator. And um, the way I want to start off with that is sort of historically the way the, way the sort of idea, idea materialized, at least for me, um, which is, was by thinking about uh, graphene. Again, graphene as a model system as opposed to being an actual system. <laughs> OK, and um, so, um, so re let me rem remind you um, that uh, so, so let's think about the, um, the energy gaps that we had in graphene. Because remember, graphene has these Dirac points. And a point that I want to make, and I'm going to make it over again, um, is that Dirac points are interesting. But um, one of the things that's most interesting about them is the, way that, the ways that you can kill them. Okay, And um, so, uh, so in graphene, uh, we have this um, Dirac Hamiltonian. And let me write it in the following way. OK, so, there's, so, so, um, so what I've done here is I've just um, I've, I've introduced a, um, a new uh, uh, Pauli matrix tau to account for the k and the k prime, the valley degree of freedom. So this is, um, so this is the valley you know, at plus or minus k. So tau z is plus or minus 1 for um, the k or the k prime point. And so, so, um, so in particular, what we noticed, and, and, and v is going to be some perturbation. Okay, and um, which which maybe lowers symmetries and opens a gap at this. So so v is going to be something which involves sigma z, so that it so that it, that it opens a gap um, uh, at the uh, Dirac points. And so the first um, the first one that we uh, thought about was um, um, you know just a sort of trivial insulator. You know, for instance, boron nitride. If we have different atoms on different atoms on the a and the b sublattice, then uh, then, then we just get a sigma z term, and that gives us a um, that gives us a, uh, a trivial insulator. And um, and it breaks p. Okay, um, it breaks uh, inversion symmetry. Okay, by by having the different atoms on the a and the b sublattice. You mean my sigma z and identity? Pardon me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's so it, it, that important. So the point the point I want to make is that the mass here um, is the same at the k and the k prime point. Okay, it has the same sign. Okay, whereas um, uh, in Haldane's model, when so Haldane um, uh, uh, introduces a different kind of periodic perturbation instead of a instead of an electric field, if you will, he introduces a magnetic field that's periodic, and um, uh, and in that case, um, so if I have the, you know Haldane's mass term, that has opposite sign at um, uh, at the k and the k prime point. So I'll write that as uh, um, a, a tau z uh, mass term, okay? And um, so so this gives me a um, you know a, a integer quantum Hall effect, okay? Um, but it breaks. It, it breaks t, okay. So you break uh, time reversal symmetry, okay. And so, uh, so back at the um, back in you know when when people were just starting to think about rethink about graphene because because it had the potential for actually being a system instead of just a model system. Um, uh, so I asked the question, well, well, um, is this all there is to say? And 
Um, so um, if you think of the fact that actually electrons have spin, then one can conceive of a mass term that doesn't break any of these symmetries. Okay, and so I want to think about a um, uh, intrinsic spin orbit term. So let me write it as um, and so um, so now uh, so so uh, S is a Pauli matrix for the actual spin of the electron, so for the up spin and for the down spin. Okay, and so what you can see from this is that. Um, uh, you know, Haldane breaks time reversal symmetry because tau z goes to minus tau z. You know, k goes to minus k under time reversal. So tau z goes to minus tau z. Um, but, uh, but this um, uh, spin also goes to minus spin under time reversal. Okay, and so this respects time reversal. And, um, and so, uh, so this respects all symmetries. Okay, um, and so uh, you know if you believe in the mantra that anything that is allowed by symmetry um, will be present, then you have to uh, 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 accept the fact that graphene will have an energy gap. Okay, because this term is allowed by symmetries, and if you look at all the crystal rotational and mirror and you know, um, this, this, this respects every symmetry, okay? And so it has to be there, okay? The catch is that it involves an interaction between the spin and the orbital degrees of freedom. So, you know, this argument that everything that's allowed by symmetry must be present, you know, that's a good thing because, you know, the, the good thing about it is you know it's right, okay? Um, but the bad thing about it is it doesn't tell you how big um, the term will be. Okay, and um, and the fact is that in graphene it's going to be puny um, because graphene is made out of carbon, which has a very weak spin orbit interaction. Okay, but nonetheless, um, my approach to this was you know rather than thinking of graphene as a system, I, I'm thinking of it as a model system, where um, where actually um, uh, this invites us to think what kind of phase of matter um, does this lead to. Okay, is it a is it a uh, insulator quantum hall? Um, and actually, it's something new. Okay, and um, and so um, so the way we can think about this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So so um, so what one can do is one can. Um, uh, so I'm not going to go through this, but but you can you can ask you can write down what the microscopic uh, spin orbit interaction is. So the microscopic is going to be something like um, uh, so you're going to have the spin of the electron. Let me call it S um, cross the momentum, you know, dotted into the gradient, of, you know, dotted into the electric field. Basically, okay, and so this is something which um, which uh, you can um, and you know and then there's a coefficient here which depends on the mass of the electron, the speed of light. This is this is the um, sort of relativistic correction to the Schrödinger equation, okay. And so then you can imagine trying to evaluate this. Um, and so what we did at, at first was to just say let's imagine we're doing some sort of k dot p approximation. So we have we have the wave functions. Um, at the Dirac point, and we can evaluate this term um, in those wave functions. Okay, and it's it's and and just from symmetry, you know that the answer you get is going to be non-zero. Okay, now now that may not that's not a particularly accurate um, uh, calculation of of, of this. Um, you know that's a you know that you know actually calculating this accurately, you need to know the details of the wave function, sort of you know, and and that's a that's a hard thing. But but as a matter of symmetry, you know that this is this is going to be non-zero. So basically, what you do is you do first order perturbation, first order degenerate perturbation theory in this in this interaction, and what you find is that you generate this term. Okay, all right. Pardon. 
E is the electric field. So it's the gradient of the, poten the crystal potential, right? So you know, there's some potential that has, you know, that has the you know, Coulomb potential of the atoms in it, and, and E is, the, is that electric field. And you know, the reason this is coming, coming about is because uh, you know, in heavy atoms, you know, um, you know, the electrons are sort of moving in this crystal potential. They're going around, and they're, and they're actually moving at a speed which is a not insignificant fraction of the speed of light. And so then the, the relativistic corrections become important. And that's the origin of the spin orbit interaction. Which component of E is NSF? What's that? Which component of E is NSF? What, which component of E? Yeah, right. E has to be the Well, it's a com oh. combination of E and P. I mean, yeah. Yeah, but what is the? All of them. I mean, yeah, they're, they're all there. I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a scalar. Yeah, so, so okay, I, I see. So look, both P and E are in the XY plane. So, so S is going to be in the Z, is going to be in the Z direction. Yeah. So it's the X and Y components, if you will. Yeah. Okay. What sort of magnitude does it have exactly? Um, what size splitting does it make? Yeah, uh, it's small. And, and, and so if I... And people have argued about, you know, whether it's whether it's really small or really really small. <laughs> um, uh, and I so so the numbers I think I, rem, you know, it's a question of whether it's microvolts or maybe tens of or hundreds of microvolts, something something like that. So 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 the question is is whether it's um, you know. Um, Kelvin or millikelvin? I, I, do, you, do, you, do you know? Do you remember those numbers? Yeah, yeah. What's that? It it may it, well. So that has yet to be measured. Okay. So so, yeah. So, but I I think the point of view that I want to take here is rather than rather than actually thinking that we're trying to describe graphene. Okay, I want to be thinking of graphene here as a model, as a model system, where it's a, it's really a nice, um, uh, it's it, it's it's a it's this it's a simple context in which we can understand the physics of this um, of this new uh, phase, and then we have to recognize that the smart way to go about finding this physics is to is to find it in materials that actually have a stronger spin orbit interaction. Okay, so um, so what does this do? So so really, what this what this mass term is? Notice that. Um, uh, SZ is still kind of a good quantum number. And so really, this just gives me two copies of the quantum Hall effect. So, so, um, so, so I can write it as uh, Haldane squared. OK, so, so I have a Hamiltonian, which in the, if I write it for the up and down spins, it's going to be Hamiltonian for the up spins. And Hamiltonian for the downspins, okay, and um, and what this is is this is just the Haldane model for the upspins with uh, sigma x y equals plus one, say, and then the Haldane model for the downspins is just the you know the the, the time reverse of that. So it'll just look like that, and so so once you have that, then you immediately know what's going on. Okay, so in particular, you know, you have an energy gap in the bulk, but Haldane model describes a quantum Hall state. So, so that means, for instance, that if you apply an electric field, you get a Hall current. So that means that uh, when you apply an electric field, the upspins go up, the downspins go down. Okay, so there's no net current that flows. The Hall sigma xy is equal to zero because the up and down spins cancel each other out. But there's a sense in which there's a spin current. Okay, now the spin current, of course, one has to be a little bit careful with one, when one thinks about spin current, because when you have a spin orbit interaction, spin isn't really conserved. But certainly in this picture, SZ is conserved in this simple uh, picture. And in that case, there's, there really is a spin current. There's a net flow of up spins going up and down spins going down. So there's a sense that there's a flow of SZ uh, going up. Okay, so that's why we called it the quantum spin hall effect. Okay, because there's a sense that, that an electric field um, 
uh, uh, induces a spin current. Okay, but one has to be careful with um, by when we're talking about spin currents when you have a spin orbit interaction. So, um, uh, but but um, a more um, uh, uh, important consequence is the fact that this has edge states. Okay, because we know that that um, uh, you know uh, you know uh, uh, the quantum Hall effect has edge states. So um, so if we have a um, if we have a uh, a system where uh, you know, we have the quantum spin hall insulator, and we have a and we have an, a boundary. Then um, there are going to be, you know, the upspins are going to have uh, an edge state which say goes this way. So this is the upspins, okay, and the downspins are going to go the other way, okay. And so this is a it's kind of a different kind of edge state. Um, in the sense that there are, it's not chiral anymore. There are things going in both directions. Okay, but somehow the there's a difference between the up between the left and right movers. They have different spin. Okay, and so so if you were to make a plot of the the band structure of this, so if I if I was going to draw the energy as a function of k, um, so let's imagine we have a we have a strip. Okay, so I have I can do it as a function of k in the um, in the x direction here. And so, um, so, so uh, I'm going to draw it again in the Brill one zone. And um, and so this basically, um, so there's going to be there's going to be you know so we have an energy gap, and um, so there's 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 sort of the projection of the k point and the minus k point. Um, you know, I'm, I'm imagining I have a sort of a zigzag uh, edge of my graphene, so that if I look at it, I see I see the projection of the k point and the minus k point, and so there's going to be these are the um, the uh, the sort of bulk states that um, that live in, it li that that live in the in the interior of your sample, but they have an energy gap, but then there's going to be the edge states. And um, and you know the story is the same in the Haldane model. In the Haldane model, what we would have seen is that the um, the upspins uh, get an edge state that sort of looks like this. Okay, so this is you know if I just had the quantum Hall effect, if I just had a single copy of Haldane's model, then I'd have an edge state that that that, that goes like this. And this this state is localized right here. Okay, and that's that's the edge state. Now, of course, um, uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, quantum spin hall, then we have the downspins as well. And so, uh, so they're going to be like that. And well, I didn't draw this very well. Um, <laughs> I'm going to move the middle. There, that's better. OK. Um, and uh, OK, so this is the downspins, and these are the upspins. OK. So, so when I first realized this, I thought, oh, this is nice. OK. Um, but there's something, um, there's something about this which is um, disturbing, which is that uh, you know, uh, you know the, the, the chiral edge states are wonderful because it's impossible to get rid of them. Okay, there's nothing you can do if you just have a single chiral mode. There's nothing, you, no perturbation you can add that can do anything to get rid of it. Whereas now, when we have these these crossing uh, edge states, uh, they're degenerate here. Okay, and you know one of the first things you learn when you study quantum mechanics is that degeneracies don't happen by accident. Okay, um, because if you have a degeneracy, you can always add a little perturbation, and uh, generically to first order, that degeneracy will be split. Okay, unless there's a good reason for, for that perturbation to be zero. Okay? Um, and so here, of course, in this model, it's kind of trivial. It's because we have the up and the down spins are independent of each other, and so that allows them to cross. And so the first thing you might think is that, well, this is an artifact of the conservation of SZ. Okay, and if that's the case, then you might think, well, if I just put some perturbation that violates the conservation of SC, after all, we're talking about a spin orbit interaction. So spin is no longer has any um, reason to be independently conserved. Then, uh, then that should get rid of this. Okay, and so I typed it into my computer, 
And I started adding terms that violate SZ conservation. And I couldn't, couldn't get rid of this degeneracy, no matter how hard I tried. And, and so, um, so that was a hint that there's something more interesting uh, going on there. Okay? And the thing that's more interesting that's going on is time reversal symmetry. And so I want to say a word about time reversal symmetry. Okay, so, um, so, so time reversal symmetry is a symmetry of the Schrodinger equation, but it's a little bit of an unusual symmetry. It's not like the like rotational symmetry or translational symmetry, which are described by having a Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian commute with a unitary um, you know, operator. Um, uh, instead, the time reversal does, does, does two things. So if I have a wave function, um, I have a time reversal, so you know I can. I, it's still an operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian, but this operator is an anti-unitary operator. Okay, so it does two things. Um, uh, oh no, uh, let, I'm sorry. It does two things. One thing is it is it rotates the spin. It takes it sort of takes the up spins to the down spins. That's so that's what this pi rotation about S Y does. And um, but it also takes the complex conjugate. Okay, so this is this is what time reversal sum symmetry um, how how time reversal symmetry is represented in um, in um, in the Schrodinger equation. Okay, now um, so in particular, if I have a spin a half particle, what this means. Um, is that if I do time reversal on a, um, you know, on a, on a, you know, on a spin a half particle that has an up and a down spin component, then um, then it, it interchanges the up and the down spins with a complex conjugate. But it also does um, another important thing, which there's this uh, minus sign here. Okay. Um, and that minus sign comes again from this uh, from this uh, pi rotation um, uh, about the uh, uh, y-axis, and this minus sign is um, it's actually the same minus sign as the minus sign that you get when you rotate um, a particle by two pi. Okay, when a spin a half gets rotated by two pi, you pick up a minus sign. It's the same minus sign showing up here. Okay, my favorite. Um, and so, uh, so this minus sign has the consequence that if you do this twice, it squares to minus one. Okay, and uh, so this minus one uh, has a consequence, which at first sight seems trivial and simple, which is Kramer's term. Okay, and so Kramer's theorem says that um, you know for spin a half, uh, all states are at least twofold degenerate. Okay. Um, if you have time reversal symmetry. Now, of course, you know, if you don't have a spin orbit interaction, it's completely trivial, right? It's just that, you know, in, in every orbital, you can put an upspin particle or a downspin particle, and those two have the same energy. Okay, so that's, that, that, that doesn't seem so interesting, but when you have a spin orbit interaction, and you can't independently talk about the spin and orbital degrees of freedom, then it has, it has more content. Okay, um, and so in particular, let me just show you why this is true. So let me um, prove this for you, and and I'm going to prove it by um, assuming that it wasn't true, and then showing there's a contradiction. So let's suppose that we could we have a spin a half particle, and and and, um, uh, and let's suppose it was non-degenerate. So let's suppose we have a state chi, a state chi, that's non-degenerate. Then, uh, 
then we know that if the Hamiltonian uh, commutes with, uh, you, you know, if this is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, then we know that uh, the time reverse on it has to give us the state back up to some constant like that. Okay? Um, if we do that again, then uh, what we're going to get, so since time reversal is anti-unitary, when it goes through C, it turns it into C star. Okay? And then um, we have to operate on chi, which then gives us just C chi, like that. Okay? And uh, so that tells us that uh, theta squared basically acting on this state is the magnitude squared of c squared, and there's no way that can be equal to minus 1. Okay, so, uh, so that's a contradiction. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so when you have time reversal symmetry, you always have a two-fold degeneracy. Okay? Um, But I don't care. So, 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 um, so when you have when you have um, uh, uh, time, uh, time reversal symmetry, you never have non-degenerate states. Okay. And so now we can look over here and sort of realize that what's going on here is something very interesting. Okay. Because um, now, of course, under time reversal symmetry, k goes to minus k. Okay, so in most of the places here, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's perfectly okay for this state to be non-degenerate. Okay, k goes to minus k, but at 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 zero, every, this state has to be twofold degenerate. Okay, so this crossing here is protected by time reversal symmetry. Okay, um, and so that was the reason I couldn't get rid of it. Is because I was I was adding time reversal symmetric perturbations. They violated S Z, um, but uh, they kept time reversal. Okay, and so this Kramer's partner, these Cra these Kramer's partners are never lifted by any time reversal invariant perturbation. Okay, and so that suggests that time reversal symmetry protects these uh, edge states. What's that? What's the corresponding picture on the armchair edge? On the armchair edge, then when you're then the when you're looking on an armchair edge, then the two the k and the k prime point sort of project on top of each other, so you get something that just look you just have a single uh, gap that looks like this, and in that case, you'd have something that looks like that. Yeah. Good. Okay. So. So now, so, so time reversal really protects these. And so, so you can actually, um, uh, uh, so let's just think about how, how well time reversal protects these states. Okay? So, so for certainly it protects you know, this crossing. But one, you know, so now we have this sort of one-dimensional metal on the boundary of our system. Okay? Now, the first thing you think when you have a one-dimensional metal is that it should be unstable in the presence of disorder, okay? You know, and actually, you know, that's the wonderful thing about the quantum Hall effect, is that the quantum Hall effect is immune to disorder, okay? Um, uh, so, so you might think that, well, let's suppose we, we, we add impurities, which will inevitably be there in any real system, to this. Um, uh, what could happen? And so, so the first thing you can think um, is that uh, the first thing you do is you say, well, if I do perturbatively, then, then the, um, the uh, impurities maybe could um, lead, lead to some elastic backscattering. Okay? But actually, if you think about it, you know, um, elastic backscattering um, uh, necessarily involves a spin flip. And, um, and so that is accomplished by the operator S minus, right? Sx minus Isy, that's, that's the operator that takes an upspin to a downspin. That operator is odd under time reversal symmetry. 
So that cannot appear in the Hamiltonian. Okay, and so, so elastic backscattering is forbidden. Yeah, but it, so. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. So, so I'm going to give you a better argument. So this is I'm 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 sort of so so it's a fact that even if I turn on the um, the uh, the um, uh, spin orbit interaction, the operator that takes me from the left moving state to the right moving state necessarily is odd under time reversal. Okay. That's the. You know that's a, that's a, that, and you can see it. It's obvious in the case when I when I if I imagine starting from this decoupled up and down spin. Okay. So. Um, okay. So elastic backscattering. Is forbidden. Okay? And basically, I'm not going to give you the proof of that, but basically the way, you can, the way you know this is the states that you're scattering between, you have these two states that you're scattering, um, you're scattering from here to here, they're at the same energy, those two states are Kramer's partners. Okay? And any operator that, that, um, that mixes the Kramer's partners must be odd under time reversal symmetry. Right, because because otherwise it would violate Kramer's theorem. <laughs> you know, any operator that that would mix these two states would split them, and that's what Kramer's theorem prevents. Okay, so so um, so elastic backscattering is forbidden. Um, actually, I can make an even stronger statement than that, um, which is that um, uh, um, uh, all states. are extended even for strong disorder. OK, and so let me give you the argument. So let's imagine that I have an edge. And um, I'm going to imagine that I have, you know, the edge is infinitely long. And I have an arb and, and inside that edge, I have an arbitrarily long uh, disordered region, okay. But I'm gonna I'm gonna allow myself to uh, say that outside that disordered region, I have um, it's clean, so I can talk about these um, these uh, edge states. So 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 I have um, so I have a disordered region. And then I have uh, outside the disordered region, I have um, my, uh, my pristine uh, edge states. Okay? And so, so now I want to ask the question, let's suppose I'm an electron, and I'm coming in, um, you know, uh, I'm coming in from the left, so I have some psi in here coming in. What happens to me? Okay, well, so I know I have a gap down in the bulk. I'm, I'm assuming I have a gap in the bulk. So I'm assuming that the disorder is not so great that I have destroyed the gap in the bulk. OK? Um, uh, so, uh, so what could happen? Well, there are really only two choices. Um, either I could be reflected, and there will be some amplitude r for reflection. Or I could be transmitted, and there will be some amplitude t for transmission. It's just a simple transmission problem, just like in first year quantum mechanics. Okay, something that has a transmission and a reflection amplitude. Okay, now, um, uh, so the, 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 the thing that you can uh, check, so if, again, if you, if you think about this reflection amplitude, notice what you're doing is you're, 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 you're coming in on a state and you're coming out in the Kramer's partner of that state. Okay? And um, so it's an exercise to convince yourself that that fact, the fact that these two are Kramer's partners of each other, implies that under time reversal symmetry, R is odd. 
Okay, so under 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 time reversal, r goes to minus r, which means that if you have time reversal symmetry, r equals zero. So t has to be equal to one. Okay, so, so that means it's impossible to have localized states, it's impossible for the states to be localized in here because any, any, any electron that comes in, ha, you know, no matter how long this and how strong the disorder is, it has to be able to come out the other side. Okay, so, so, so these, um, uh, these edge states evade Anderson localization, which occurs in any ordinary disordered one-dimensional conductor. Okay, so there's there so in that sense, like the quantum Hall effect, they're they're special. Okay, they're protected in a sense. Okay, it's not quite as good as the quantum Hall effect because of course if you if you allow yourself to break time reversal symmetry, then in principle um, this all goes away and you and 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 um, and the states can become localized. Okay. I'm only talking about elastic. That's a very good, very good point. Okay, so um, so I'm talking about zero temperature. You know the the eigenstates of the system. Okay, now at finite temperature, then maybe you can scatter off of phonons, or you know there there are there are, there are processes. Maybe you could you could do a backscattering, kicking up a particle hole pair. Okay, so there are inelastic processes that can occur. Those processes are not forbidden, okay? So um, because, because for those processes, you know, so the thing is when I do the reflection, um, if I think of it as a motion picture and run the motion picture backwards, it looks exactly the same, right? So if I come in and I'm reflected, if I run it backwards, then I'm coming, I'm, you know, doing the same thing. Okay, but if you have an inelastic process, it doesn't look the same because because you know if you're if you're having a process where you're reflected and emitting a phonon, when I run the when I, when I run the run it backwards, I'm absorbing a phonon instead of emitting a phonon. So it so 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 those two processes are not the same, and for that reason, um, time reversal symmetry does not forbid inelastic scattering. So in general, if you have inelastic backscattering processes off of phonons or other electrons, then those can um, uh, lead to, um, uh, lead to uh, reflection. Okay? And those in general will lead to a finite conductivity of your, um, of your, uh, 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 of your edge. Okay? And so, um, so that's a sense in which these edge states are less protected than the um, than in the quantum Hall effect, where even for inelastic processes, there's nowhere for the electrons to go but forward. Okay. You mean the other edge? Yeah. Of course. Oh, of course. I'm assuming. I mean, that's the the same thing is true in the quantum Hall effect. Okay, if you don't have if you don't have the you know so 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 we're we're relying on the fact that the bulk has a gap, and that the so there's an exponential decay into the bulk, and your your width is much much larger than that exponential decay. If that's not the case, then then of course you can always then then it turns into just a regular one dimensional system, which which gets Anderson localized. But and that's true in the quantum Hall effect as well. Eat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So then there's a there's another copy of this on the other side. Yes. That'll depend on on what's going on in here. So in general, there can be a forward scattering phase shift. That's okay. And and that could be anything. All right, so, so what we see here is that there's something special about these edges. They're protected. You can't get rid of them. It's impossible to get rid of them. And um, so, uh, so you can ask the question, well, um, what is it about the bulk, the interior of this quantum spin hall insulator that knows that it has to have an edge state? 
So this, there must be some structure, some bulk structure. You remember, in the quantum Hall effect, we had the, in the bulk, we had the churn number, which topologically characterized the bulk. Um, and if the churn number was non-zero, you have to have the edge states. Okay. So what do we have here? So now, of course, we have time reversal symmetry, which means that the churn number has to be equal to zero. Okay. So that's not the churn number. So there must be something else. Okay. And so, in fact, um, what we now know is that um, uh, for uh, Hamiltonians, uh, so if we constrain the Hamiltonians such that they um, such that under time reversal, h of minus k is the time reverse of h of k. Okay? So if we add this constraint to the topological classification problem, so now I'm only classifying Hamiltonians that satisfy this constraint, then um, uh, um, what we get is that there is a Z2 topological invariant. And what that means is that there are two classes of time reversal invariant two-dimensional insulators. One of them is trivial and doesn't have to have edge states. The other one has these edge states like I showed you. Okay? And so, um, so it was a hard problem to figure out this, uh, this Z2 invariant. Okay? That was hard for me. Um, uh, but um, a simple thing that one can see is that there are two and only two possibilities. And so let me first convince you of that, and then I'll try to construct for you what this Z2 invariant is. No, no, it's something, it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit harder. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue this by, again, thinking about the edge states. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this picture again. Um, uh, but I'm going to draw it a little bit more schematically. I'm only going to draw half of it, actually. Because you know if you have time reversal symmetry, this half is related to this half. So I'm going to make a plot. So I have k equals 0, k equals pi. Okay? And um, so again, in general, um, I'm going to have some uh, bulk states that are separated by an energy gap. Okay? And now, you can always, if you have a gap and you have surface states, you can always have states that are localized um, on the surface. You can always, the surface states are always possible no matter what. Okay? The thing you know, though, is that at k equals 0, if you have a surface state, it has to have a partner. Okay, So it has to be doubly degenerate. And as you move away from k equals 0, um, uh, it, in general, if you have a spin-orbit interaction, of course, if you don't have a spin-orbit interaction, then every state is twofold degenerate. But if you have a spin-orbit interaction, then in general, it'll split. Because again, this guy's partner is at minus k. Okay. Now, so this is true at k equals 0. Now, remember, um, uh, k equals pi is the same point as k equals minus pi. So that means that at k equals pi, you also have to have uh, Kramer's uh, uh, partners. Okay. And so the interesting question is, uh, how do these Kramer's partners connect up with these Kramer's partners? So one possibility is sort of the trivial possibility is that they they sort of connect like this, and maybe this one goes up. Okay, and if it looks like this, then uh, you know this. These are not protected because I can just I can just take these and imagine deforming my Hamiltonian, taking these, pulling these down, and pushing these up, and getting rid of them completely. So these edge states are not protected. They don't have to be there. They could be there, but they don't have to. And so, um, so this is a conventional insulator. OK? 
okay? But when you think about it like this, you can immediately see that there's one other possibility, okay? Which is, which is that your Kramer's partners could switch partners. So, so instead, they could connect like that. Okay? And if they connect like this, then you can see that you could, you know, you could pull these up and down all you want. You can't get rid of them. You can't get rid of them as long as you keep time reversal symmetry, which glues these states together at these time reversal invariant points. This is k equals 0, k equals pi. Okay, and um, and so this is the um, this is the topological insulator. So this one I'll call nu equals zero, nu equals one, where nu is is my z two topological invariant. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so this, you could say, is exactly, I don't. I'm saying, I'm saying there, there could be. I mean, of course, I could pull this. I could, I could imagine deforming it and pulling it down. And I could deform and pull that one up, and then it would look like that. Okay? Or I could pull, there, there could be more of them. But the thing is, is that the pattern is that it has to go zigzag, zigzag, you know, the, 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 the valence band and the conduction band have to be connected by these, um, these surface states. You can't get rid of them, okay? Um, uh, you know, but, but you know, it, it doesn't tell you how, and, you know, the other thing, it could also, you know, maybe they could do that too. And, and so there might be, there might be lots of uh, states at the Fermi energy, okay? So you can ask yourself, what's the difference between this and this. So there might be states at the Fermi energy here also, but here you can see that there's always going to be an even number of crossings, okay? And here you can see there's always going to be an odd number of crossings, okay? And so, um, so this, this, the difference between the edge states here and here is you have an even or an odd number of crossings. Of course, the even number might not be zero. You might have, you might have surface states uh, or edge states. Um, but the odd number cannot be equal to zero, okay? All right. Okay. So, so hopefully this convinces you that there are these two different phases, which are kind of like the, the different phases in the quantum Hall effect, where there we have an integer you know, class of different numbers of phases characterized by different integers. And um, so, uh, again, before I sort of try to calculate this Z2 invariant, I want to try to understand physically how we can think about what the difference between these two states is. And so what I'd like to give you is some kind of um, uh, a variant on the Laughlin argument, okay? And so remember, Laughlin's argument was this very nice argument where you put the quantum Hall state on a cylinder, and then um, you discover that when you thread a magnetic flux through the cylinder, you do something drastic. You pump an electric charge from one end of the cylinder to the other. So I want to think about a similar kind of construction for the um, quantum spin hall insulator to try to characterize the difference between a trivial insulator and a topological insulator. So I want to give you a variant on the Laughlin argument. So I want to uh, consider my cylinder. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to thread magnetic flux, okay? Um, and uh, so um, and uh, what I'm going to do is now remember for what Laughlin did is he threaded a whole flux quantum. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to thread half a flux quantum. So 
So I'm not going through a complete cycle. I mean, I'm not coming back to exactly where I started. But the thing that's significant about half a flux quantum is that when the, flux quant when the magnetic flux going through here is equal to zero, then I, I have time reversal. You know, the magnetic flux breaks time reversal in general. But when the flux is zero, I have time reversal symmetry. When the flux is half of a flux quantum, well, half a flux quantum is gauge equivalent to minus half a flux quantum, and that's what time reversal does. Okay? So when you have half of a flux quantum, then your system has time reversal symmetry. It's kind of the same as, um, uh, you know, uh, under time reversal, k equals pi, k equals pi has time reversal symmetry, right? Because pi and minus pi are actually the same point. Okay? So, um, so that means that there's a special significance. And so what that means is that um, uh, when uh, the flux is either is equal to zero or pi over two, a phi, a phi naught over two, you have Kramer's theorem that says that states have to be uh, degenerate or not. Okay? So, um, so let's think about what's going to happen. So, uh, so if I thread this half of a flux quantum, then um, so let's think about what happens in the simple case where it's really just two copies of the, um, of the uh, 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 Haldane model. Just you know, two, two quantum Hall effects for upspins and downspins. Okay, so then it's just like a it's just like Laughlin's argument. I thread the flux. I'm going to pump some charge. But since I'm only uh, pumping half of a flux quantum, then that means that the upspins I'm going to I'm going to get uh, one half of an upspin uh, uh, gets pumped to the right, and um, uh, half of a downspin is going to get pumped to the left. Okay, so, so there's no charge that gets pumped across. Okay, but, but at, at the end of the day, what I get is um, I get, you know, um, that I get, uh, you know, um, uh, SZ goes to SZ plus a half. So it's as if, it's as if I, I get an extra spin a half at this end and an extra spin minus a half at this end. Okay, so it's like I've, I've changed the total spin at the end by h bar over 2. Okay, now the thing you know, what Kramer's theorem says is that when you have a integer spin, the states aren't degenerate, but when you have a half integer spin, the states are Kramer's degenerate. And so, so if I look at the many body spectrum now, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a plot as a, of the energy, and this is the many body spectrum. Okay, as a function of uh, flux. So I have zero and phi naught over two. Then what happens here is I start off, and um, so let's suppose I start off in a situation where um, uh, all of my states are, you know, um, uh, you know, where all of my uh, Kramer's pairs of states are all doubly occupied. So the ground state then has an even number, you know, of electrons, and so so I have I start off with a spectrum that looks like this with a with a unique ground state. When I've gotten to phi naught over two, then I have to have a doubly degenerate ground state. Okay, and so uh, so uh, um, so so here I have a Kramer's degeneracy, and here I have no Kramer's. Pardon? Okay, so the argument is that when I thread half of a flux quantum, it's as if I change the spin at the end by one half. So that means that the states at the end um, uh, go from, um, uh, uh, you know, it, so it's as if I added an electron to the end. It's kind of like changing the polarization. Okay, so it's as if I add an electron. It's as if I change the number of electrons at the end 
from being even to being odd. Okay, and um, uh, and so that means that whether or not you have a Kramer's degeneracy in the many-body ground state changes from either yes to no or from no to yes. Okay, and so in the way I drew it, it goes from no, it's like I have an integer number of electrons to having a half integer number of electrons. Okay, so, so, the, so the process of threading half a flux, it doesn't transport any charge, but it transports the, the, whether the charge is even or odd, the parity of the number of, of electrons. Okay, and, um, and that is reflected in a concrete way by the existence um, or non-existence of a Kramer's degeneracy in the uh, many particle spectrum. Yeah. Um, good. Yeah. So it's it's um, I'm I'm looking. Yeah. So th of course the the total system will also have the other edge, and so there will be another uh, you know set of states that are that are uh, you know on top of that as well. Okay. But um, but you know uh, uh, you know things are sort of you know since I have a gap in the bulk, it makes sense to focus on what's going on at one end. What? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not coming back to myself. Yeah. But but you see the thing is is that something has changed when I let thread half of a flux quantum. Okay? And something sharp has changed. And it's that sharp change which is the essence of this Z2 invariant. So, so, um, uh, and, and the sharp thing that, is, that has changed, you see, you see, if you have a trivial insulator, then nothing knows about this magnetic flux because everything's kind of localized. And so nothing happens when you thread half a flux. Okay? But if you have a topological insulator, then um, you have this change of the local fermion parity. Okay? And, and so one has to think about how one defines a local fermion parity. I don't want to get too much into that. But, but, um, uh, but I think on physical terms, it, uh, it kind of makes sense. And, and certainly, if you, if you think in the non-interacting picture, this is exactly what happens. Okay? Um, uh, um, so if you ask what happens if you have edge states like this, um, and you thread the half of flux quantum, you see you do exactly this, this uh, switching. Okay. Well, I used that in order to motivate the fact that, that it's sort of like sw you know, changing the spin by a half. That was just, I was just trying to motivate. So, so certainly in that case, SZ at the end does change by one half, okay? which implies that the local Kramer's degeneracy changes. Okay? Now, of course, when I, if, I, if I relax the conservation of SZ, I can't talk about SZ anymore, but I can still talk about the local Kramer's degeneracy. That, that remains well-defined even when I have a spin-orbit interaction. Okay? Yeah. I'm sorry, could you start, start that again? I couldn't, I couldn't hear it. Ladder. Well, if I had a conventional insulator, then, um, then everything, I mean, nothing happens when you thread the flux. Okay, and so, that, so in that case, you'd have a picture which either, which, which basically looks like this, right? So, 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 so you have some ground state, and you still have a ground state when you, and, and it's still unique when you, uh, you know, after you've threaded the flux. Well, no, there, there's no channel here either. I mean, there's no, there's no edge state that is running along the cylinder. It's not, it, this, is, this is happening in the bulk. There's a gap everywhere here. 
So it's really a property of the bulk, not, not of some edge channel. Yeah. Well, I'm using that, but I'm realizing that when I use that, I discover something that's more general than the than 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 that than 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 the than than the SZ conservation assumption. I'm just using that to motivate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. Pardon? Well, because Laughlin's argument shows that the charge that gets pumped is exactly uh, the flux in units of flux quanta. Um, no, I don't think so. I think, I think uh, what do you mean, integrating over the entire Brouwen zone? Well, no, but Laughlin, of course, is going through an entire cycle. Right. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, <laughs> if I thread half a flux quantum, I transport half as much charge as I would if I threaded one flux quantum. And if I thread one flux quantum, I get a sharp E. So if I thread half, I get a sharp half, half E. It, you know, so it's not that much more complicated. Yeah. No, but no, look. But that's not what I'm talking about, okay? So, so, so I'm just trying to motivate, in the simplest terms, having you know, this, this setup. So I, I'm, I'm going to move on. <laughs> so, um, so the next question, okay? So, so I hope you can believe there's a difference between these two, between having, uh, you know, uh, uh, having this and not having this. And so the question that you can ask then is that what property of the bulk gives you that? Okay. And um, and so again, so so uh, so how can we describe this uh, Z two topological invariant? And so I thought I'm going to give you a little bit of a. There are several formulations of how you compute this Z two invariant. And uh, again, for me, this was a hard problem. And the first way I thought about it was not the best way. Um, and um, okay, so it's not as simple as just integrating the Berry curvature over the Brill one zone, which is the way we got the uh, Brill one zone. Okay, w the way we got the churn number. So, um, so, uh, so I'm going to give you a formulation which has some conceptual value. Okay, and so the starting point is I have I have block wave functions So let's suppose I have my um, my uh, block wave functions um, uh, Which uh, have uh, you know, and there are maybe n uh, n occupied bands in the valence band. Okay now um, uh, so so I am going to um, uh, take as given that I can choose these block wave functions and define them uh, continuously everywhere in the Brill one zone. Okay? And that I can do because the obstruction to doing that is the churn number, which is equal to zero. Okay? So, um, so given the fact that these are defined, um, uh, then I'm going to come up with a very simple formulation for the uh, Z2 invariant. Okay? Now, if you're going to do this numerically, okay, then the fact that you, that this uh, continuous gauge is guaranteed to exist 
is, uh, you know, numerically, it's non-trivial because when you do it on a computer, you know, you diagonalize every, your Hamiltonian for every value of k, your computer gives you some eigenvector, um, and, and, and it's not guaranteed to be continuous. Okay, and so, so, um, so if you're actually going to compute the Z2 invariant on a computer, you have to do some work in order to establish a um, continuous gauge, and there are various, various algorithms for sort of getting that right. Okay, but, um, but just conceptually, let's imagine that we, we accept that we have a, um, a, a, a globally defined gauge for our, for our states. Okay, so then, um, uh, you, yes? Spins, so that for each state, the time well, I have spin-orbit spin interactions, so, so everything spin is mixed. So, so yeah, of course, because I have time reversal so symmetry. I mean, the time rever the, but the, the, the time reverse is at, at, the state at k is at minus k. Yeah, but it's not necessarily the case that they have. Look, let me put it this way. The number of bands is even. Okay, that's what I'm asking. Okay. It's guaranteed to be even. No, time reversal symmetry requires. Still have bands that cross the Fermi energy and the no, I'm talking about an insulator, though. I don't have bands that cross the Fermi energy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Okay. So why? Uh, so what I want to define is an object. Which, de which describes the relationship between the states at k and the states at minus k. OK? So this is a matrix. This is an n by n matrix okay, that compares the states at k with the time reverse of the states at minus k. Now, since I have time reversal symmetry, the states at k are the time reverse of the states at minus k. And so that means that this, this uh, matrix, that, that the states at k are related to the time reverse of the states at minus k by a unitary transformation. So these are, this is um, a unitary uh, matrix. Okay. But this unitary matrix has a special property, um, which is that, uh, you know, since... Uh, since time reversal squares to minus 1, what I can do is I can, I can if I have this overlap, I can, I can make a new overlap, which is the overlap of theta squared on this with theta on this. And since theta squares to minus 1, what that implies is that w at k is equal to minus, and that's this minus sign, the, um, the transpose of w at minus k. Okay, so it's not too hard to uh, using the the property of um, matrix elements of anti-unitary operators. It's um, it's straightforward to see this, and this minus sign is this minus sign. Okay, so what this means, in particular, is that if I look at so here I have a bro one zone kx, ky. If I look there, there are these four special points where, you know, at 0, k, k is equal to minus, 0 is equal to minus 0. Pi 0 is equal to minus pi 0. Pi pi is equal to minus pi minus pi. You know, so these four points, k is equal to minus k. So in particular, um, this implies that for k equal one of these time reversal invariant points, w is a skew symmetric matrix. It's sort of anti-symmetric um, on, on the di uh, you know if I interchange the rows and columns. Um, how do you 
how did I define the block functions to be continuous at those points? Um, uh, what's really important is the space that's spanned by block functions. So, so um, uh, I can. So, given my set of occupied uh, 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 block functions, I can choose any linear combination of those. Okay, and and those will be those will give me exactly the same many-body state. Okay, if I populate some linear combination of states, that gives me the same state. And so, it's always possible to choose a linear linear a, a linear combination of these states that span the same space. And um, and those can be chosen continuously. I understand that you know you're worried about the fact that you have Kramer's points and that it looks like something if I if I that it should be uh, singular. But but if I if I allow myself to choose linear combinations of the different states, then I can choose those linear combinations uh, continuously. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, so I guess another, another question that someone might ask at this point is whether the UN of K, as well as being continuous, uh, are coming out of pairs. UN of K? What, oh, the, uh, at, well, certainly, um, so, so here's what I can say is that, uh, you know, I have a set of states at minus K. Okay, and I have a set of states u n of k. The thing that I know is, and if I take the time reverse of these states, then what I know is that the space spanned by these states has to be exactly the same as the space spanned by these states. And these are going to be related by a, uh, you know, uh, unitary transformation. Okay, and in general, different gauges could have different unitary. I mean, you know, you know how I choose the states at k and how I choose the states at minus k. I can choose. I can independently make choices for what what uh, basis I use for those states. Um, but uh, uh, there will always be a unitary matrix that relates them. Um, Well, or, or I think you can choose it so that it is, um, uh, you could choose it so that it, instead of being the identity, it's sort of uh, 1 minus 1 on the off diagonal. That, that you could do. Because time reversal has to square to minus 1. And so, 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 so but I'm, I'm, uh, I don't think we need to worry about that. What's that? So, so if you choose one minus one, if if you de if you demand that you you have this be equal to this one minus one, then the z two invariant is the obstruction to choosing u continuously. Okay, so that, but that's that's a different formulation of the invariant which I'm not going to yeah. do. Okay, but but one can do that as well. So I'm not making any, I'm, I'm going to imagine that W is, I'm not going to try to fix W. So, but, um, uh, but what I can say is that at these special points, W is anti-symmetric. And anti-symmetric matrices have a very magical property, um, which is that they have a Fafian. So Nick told us about the Fafian yesterday. And the Fafian um, of a matrix has the property that the determinant of the matrix, the determinant of an anti-symmetric matrix is a perfect square. And it is the square of the Fafian. OK? 
Okay, and so this is so so it's a it's a it's an amazing property of anti-symmetric skew symmetric matrices that they're determined as a perfect square. So I'm not going to prove that to you in general, but just look, let's just think about the simplest one. Um, if you look at the matrix, uh, a two by two uh, anti-symmetric matrix, you know the determinant of this is equal to z squared. So that's a perfect square, right? And so um, so z is the Fafian of this matrix. Okay, and if you work it out for you know, a four by four matrix, then you see that uh, the determinant is again a perfect, uh, the perfect square of a polynomial in the entries of the entries of the matrix. Okay, and so what this what this fact means is that at these time reversal invariant points, we have we can define a quantity, which I'm going to call delta delta of uh, lambda a, which is equal to the Fafian which is defined, divided by the square root of the determinant. Okay, and so your first thought is that uh, that's completely stupid. Right, because you know, you know, and so, so this has got to be equal to plus or minus one. So your first thought, this is stupid, because you know, of course, when I take the square root, I can choose whichever sign I want, and and uh, and that'll change what sign I get. Okay, so the, so so this is completely ill-defined given the um, the square root ambiguity of um, of the uh, of the of the square root. But notice that uh, W is defined everywhere. So W is defined throughout the entire Brillouin zone, which means that I get to choose the branch of the square root once. And so that means that if I compare different time reversal invariant points, So if I look at delta of gamma A, delta of gamma B, and I so this is going to be equal to plus or minus 1 as well, if I uh, demand that I choose the same branch of the square root at, at both of those points, which is, you know, and that's, you know, W is globally defined. Then, uh, then this does not suffer from the um, from the square root ambiguity. Okay, but it's still problematic. So, um, so this, in fact, so this fixes the square root ambiguity, but it's still uh, it's still not uh, gauge invariant. In, in the sense that um, uh, it's not gauge invariant in the same sense that the polarization was not gauge invariant. It is, it is not gauge invariant under a large gauge transformation. So if I do the kind of gauge transformation that changed the polarization by an integer, then that will change the sign of this. So this is sort of like the analog of the polarization. Okay, so if I take the product of two of these, it's like the analog of the polarization. Okay, um, but uh, like the polarization, so for the polarization, changes in the polarization were well defined, and that is what the Z2 invariant is. So, so if I if I um, uh, 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 if I do a large gauge transformation, 
where you know um, my the phase of my wave function wraps by you know I change the phase of my wave function in a way that it wraps by two pi going around the bro one zone. Then uh, that will change. You know, so, so let's suppose, so I have a, you know, the Brill 1 zone is a torus going around this way. And so if I, if I, um, if I uh, inter introduce a large gauge transformation, which, which puts a 2 pi twist going around this way, then that changes this product to minus itself. Okay? But it also changes this product to minus itself. And so the product of the two of them is invariant. Okay. And, and it's really the same, the same kind of thing happened with the polarization. So with the polarization, I had the, you know, the Berry phase along this cycle, and that changed, that changed by an integer when I, when I did this. But I also had the Berry phase along this cycle. That changes by the same integer. And so when I, do the, when I, when I, when I, when I compare them, actually, I guess I'm doing the Berry phase down here and up here. When I compare them, um, then, it's, um, then it's invariant. Okay. All right. No. Well, I, no, I, no, no, no. I mean, so it's important. You can't calculate this by just looking at one of the k points. Okay. So th it, this, so this is this is sort of hiding some subtlety here, right? So if I just had the Hamiltonian at these lambda a's, then I wouldn't know what sign to choose the square root of the determinant. Okay. So you have to do you. So so this is really a global property. Um, uh, it, it's, it's crucial that you choose this, this gauge, which is defined uh, uh, continuously. So you're guaranteed that you can do that, um, uh, but that requires global information. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so in general, this is, you know, so this is in general, it's not so easy to calculate this in general. It's easier if you have some extra symmetry. So for instance, if you have the spin conservation symmetry, then it's kind of easy, okay? Because then, then you can just calculate the churn numbers for the up and the down spins independently. And then this then turns out to just be whether the churn numbers are even or odd. Another uh, way that it is um, uh, simple is that with inversion symmetry, If I have inversion symmetry, then uh, this delta at gamma a is equal just to the product of uh, parity eigenvalues. So every state um, at, uh, at, at these points, if you have inversion symmetry, is going to be either even or odd under parity going to have an eigenvalue plus or minus one. And um, so uh, what one can show is that uh, in that case, this z2 invariant is just, um, is just uh, it, it, that, that, that this delta in a particular gauge is equal, to, um, is equal to just the product of the parity eigenvalues. OK, so this makes it easy to compute the z2 invariant. You just need to look up the uh, parity eigenvalues and multiply them all together. Yes, yeah, with P, uh, of course, yeah, yeah. If you don't have time reversal, then we're not talking about topological insulators, yeah. Uh, for non-square lattice, are we guaranteed we always get even number of time reversal invariant? Yes, manifold? yes, yeah. There's always, in two dimensions, there's always four. Okay. All right, so I finish in five minutes, right? Okay, well, I only have, uh, you know, an hour to go, <laughs> well, but I will, I will finish. So I, get, I, I, I guess I will, um, let me just finish by talking about um, uh, the real two-dimensional topological insulators, and then and that, that'll have to be it. My notes go further.
Okay, so as a, you know, so we thought about this in graphing at first, and that was really a model system. Um, uh, the smart way to, to uh, make this come to life is to think about uh, materials with a strong spin-orbit interaction, and um, and so there, mercury, cadmium, tel telluride is the perfect uh, system. And so this is uh, this was an insight by uh, Bernavig, Hughes, and Zhang. And also um, experiments by uh, Mollenkamp a little bit later. Um, and so, um, so the thing about uh, um, so mercury cadmium telluride, this, this, it's a semiconductor. Okay, it's a usual semiconductor. So, so cadmium telluride is actually kind of a conventional semiconductor in the sense that its band structure has. Um, has the, the band structure that a usual semiconductor has. Okay, it's sort of like gallium arsenide. Um, it has uh, sort of S-like states in the conduction band and P-like states uh, in the valence band. Okay, um, so, so uh, mercury telluride, on the other hand, uh, due to the fact that her mercury is very heavy, okay, relativistic effects start taking, um, uh, becoming important. And what that has the effect of is doing is moving the relative order of these bands. And essentially, um, the S state sort of moves below the P state. And so it ends up, ends up having a, um, uh, a structure that, um, that looks like this, okay, where the S state and the P state have become inverted. Okay, um, and so uh, so this uh, this the notion of this um, band inversion, um, uh, you know, makes one think that maybe one can go through some kind of transition in doing that. And so that's the real insight that uh, Xu Sheng Zhang sort of introduced to the problem of of trying to engineer band inversions. Okay, and um, and so in particular, if you have a um, uh, a quantum well structure, making you know in two dimensions. So you make a little sandwich where you have uh, mercury telluride in the middle, and then you have. Uh, so actually, what they use is some alloy, alloy of mercury cadmium telluride. Okay, where but basically uh, this is sort of behaving more like this is like the conventional. Uh, uh, insulator and 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 this is this in, inverted one. Then you have a two-dimensional um, uh, 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 quantum well that has some thi thickness d. Okay, and so what one finds is that um, if uh, d is um, uh, is is less than some critical value, which I think is six point three nanometers. Then basically, what you get is you get a quantum well, which is kind of like the trivial. It, it sort of gets it's so thin that you don't really know that much about the band inversion, and it looks like uh, it looks like this. So you get um, a uh, two-dimensional band structure where you have again the uh, S state and the P state um, uh, are um, in the conduction band and the valence band, and now the um, uh, the um, the the symmetry is lowered, so really these you re, you really just have um, th these states are just twofold degenerate um, uh, uh, due to spin. Okay, um, uh, but when you have a wider quantum well, then what happens is that these states uh, invert. So you get the S state downstairs and the P state upstairs, and um, and so there's a inversion that occurs, and between these two, um, uh, if we if we uh, assume for the moment that mercury telluride has inversion symmetry, which is not true, but it's actually reasonable to think about it that way, um, then you can see that uh, the S and P states cross, which means that the product of parity eigenvalues um, is going to switch. Okay, so in this case, the product of parity eigenvalues is equal to plus one, and it's trivial. In this case, the product of parity eigenvalues is equal to minus one, and it's a topological insulator. Okay, and um, so uh, so this uh, so this uh, insight um, uh, of of Bernavig, Hughes, and Zhang then sort of led to those these uh, experiments by Mollenkamp. And let me just I guess the last thing let me do is let me just write down the Bernavig, Hughes, Zhang model. 
for, um, for how one can do, do this. And this sort of really um, sort of gets at this idea of um, uh, getting to the quantum spin hall state by a band inversion. And so, um, so let me just write down the, the BHZ model, and then that'll have to be it. So basically, the BHZ model takes into account the, um, that you have two orbitals that are, that are, that are here, the, uh, sort of an S-like state and a P-like state. And I'm going to index those by um, uh, tau z. And then they get coupled to each other by a spin orbit type interaction. Where this, where this is uh, spin now, OK? And um, so, uh, um, so in this case, um, uh, if you have the, um, uh, so if the mass is bigger than 0, this is the uninverted case. And if the mass is less than 0, then it's the inverted case. Okay. Now, of course, and it, now of course, by this is sort of a, a uh, sort of a low energy theory that is defined in the vicinity of um, of the the point where the inversion takes place. So this model by itself, of course, doesn't know which phase is the topological insulator and which phase is the trivial insulator. Okay, but um, but we know that this phase is the trivial insulator. Okay, and so so. Um, so we know that the uh, small d is the, is, the, is the trivial insulator. And so that, uh, that allows us to identify which phase um, is which. And so with this model, one can do the same kind of analysis that we did for the quantum Hall effect. You have domain walls, and you get edge states. And, but these edge states are helical edge states. They have both the right and left movers. And, um, and so, uh, so this is a, um, a simple way of seeing that. And uh, I wish I could go on for longer. Um, but I can't. So uh, you know. So uh, what else can one talk about? One can talk about three-dimensional topological insulators. One can talk about the surface of three-dimensional topological insulators. One can talk about superconductivity. There's a lot to talk about, um, but there's only so much time. So uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And as we tune the thickness, the effective model changes. Yeah. That's right. So you can sort of think that um, changing the thickness is tuning this parameter m. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, so the way I see the BHZ model is that is that there's a critical point where where um, uh, where you go through this transition, and the BHZ model is sort of a model that sort of takes that as your starting point and then is looking at perturbations about that. And M is the perturbation that takes you away from that. So it's really sort of, so this particular model is really in sort of in the spirit of k dot p uh, perturbation. Now, of course, one can also write down, and BHZ did write down a tight binding model, OK, where you build in the fact that you know, you know, so, so in the tight binding model, you can, you can, you can design it so that, so that um, uh, so that you know which phase is which, okay? And, and then you can calculate the Z2 invariant. You know, the simple way you can do it is by just doing the product of parity diet. Yeah. So this varying this thickness, you, you only do that to see the phase transition. If you were to think like half, what you get is like half of your density. Like, yeah, you can see the phase Wait, 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 half and half? Then, then it's not two-dimensional. I mean, this, you mean just the interface? Then, 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 uh, um, no, I don't think, no. Now, so one, so one problem with that is that mercury telluride by itself actually doesn't have a gap. OK, so, so, so again, you have this band inversion. These states, these, um, these states um, 
Uh, this is actually a fourfold degeneracy, and that fourfold degeneracy is protected by the crystal symmetry of Mercury Telluride. Okay, and um, so so if you just had you know if you just had you know bulk Mercury Telluride on the bottom, then it wouldn't then you'd have a three-dimensional something that's not an insulator. Okay, now of course if you if you strain the Mercury Telluride so you lower the symmetry, then you do open up a gap here. And in fact, that becomes a three-dimensional topological insulator. Okay. Due to degeneracy, the commerce degeneracy, the products of all the parity eigenvalues should always be one. Very good. Thank you. Yes. So, but the, the so but the the parity eigenvalues come in pairs. I mean, so so ev so every state is 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 Kramer's degenerate, but both Kramer's partners have the same. Parity I can value. So I'm only taking one of them for each pair. But the parity eigenvalues can only change by a change in the spatial origin. Huh? The parity eigenvalues they can only change when you change the spatial origin. What do you mean they can only change when I change this? They're only they only vary in the I don't understand what you mean. Well, no, the only way, I mean, so the only way that the product of parity eigenvalues can change is if I go through a transition where I take an S state from the valence band and trade it with a P state from the conduction band. So, so the only way the parity eigenvalues can change is if I go through a transition where the gap goes to zero. You're disagreeing with the fact that it can be negative? No, this particular uh, the product of parity eigenvalues equals. And again, I'm only taking each Kramer's pair one. You know, I'm I'm only this is only half of the states because they come in pairs. Right, right. My, my claim is that the product can change the parity eigenvalues Right, okay, so you could change this. You might change this. That would be like choos choosing a different gauge. Yeah, I agree. This could change, but that will not change this. No, no, but it, but it doesn't matter which spatial origin you choose. I agree with you that choosing different spatial origins could could give you different plus and minus signs for the for the C's. Okay, and then maybe your deltas would be different, but I don't assign physical meaning to this delta by itself. It's only the product of all four that. Um, that uh, that I want to associate with the um, with the topological uh, invariant. Okay. So so and that I guarantee you will be independent of which origin you choose for your inversion centers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That and the reason for that is is because it's possible to backscatter into a state that is not the Kramer's partner of the state that you started from. Okay. So in a real one-dimensional wire, you have upspins and downspins, and so of course you could backscatter into the Kramer's partner. In, in fact, you won't. Or, or but 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 you could also backscatter into the, the the one that isn't your Kramer's partner. And that's cost. Yes. Okay, let's take a break. Hey. So uh, I understand that uh, in the lot, I mean in the heat collection degree, Adega arrow cannot be exist because of time reversal. But such term can definitely exist with an extra derivative. I mean, such binear can exist. And uh, I just want to mention that. Uh,